Good afternoon, everyone. This is Larry Stevens. I'm the Curator of Biology at the Museum of Northern Arizona. I'll be talking to you about the butterflies and skippers of Grand Canyon and the Colorado Plateau. What I'd like to do today is to talk a little bit about uh, the, the history of research at Grand, at, at, uh, in Grand Canyon by the New Museum of Northern Arizona, and talk a little bit about the geography of Grand Canyon and how landform, uh, landforms have changed over time there before we begin to talk about butter, butterfly and skipper evolution. Some of you might not be familiar with skippers, but we'll talk about them. We'll talk about the taxonomy of these groups of, of insects, their diversity, their ecology and natural history, uh, stories of adaptive coloration, host plant associations, et cetera, and talk about climate change impacts. I'm a biologist and can't really speak as well as I, uh, would like to be able to about the cultural aspects of butterflies and hopefully that'll be a talk that we have here um, uh, before too long. The Museum of Northern Arizona has a really long history of work in Grand Canyon spanning actually more than 100 years at this point even though some of our, our early players like Walter McDougall uh, were not part of the museum uh, uh, prior to uh, uh, when his work initiated in Grand Canyon but he's really the father of Grand Canyon botany and he's he published many Grand Canyon plant books, articles, described new species, et cetera, from the landscape. Eddie McKee was the first ranger naturalist uh, in Grand Canyon National Park. He was a um, well-known geologist later in life, but he started out as a, as a biologist and put together many of the first species lists of, of different kinds of organisms in Grand Canyon. Steve Carruthers held the position that I have here, now curator of biology, uh, back in the 1970s and, uh, and was a prominent architect of management, uh, not only the biology and ecology of the, of the Colorado River and Grand Canyon, but also of how to manage the, those resources. He conducted the first ecological inventory of the, of the river corridor, did much work on fish. He was a principal player in uh, the Park Service recognizing that burrow grazing needed to be removed from Grand Canyon and uh, was an advisor on Glen Canyon Dam management as well. Tom Checkness has been a volunteer at the museum for many years. He's an engineer, he was an engineer, he's retired now, uh, but he's a, a long-term butterfly enthusiast and a really extraordinary photographer. So many of the photos that you'll see today are the result of his really just fabulous photography of butterflies. Stepping to the geography of the landscape that we're looking at here, Grand Canyon is about the, in, the, in about the middle of the Colorado River's course from the Green River and, and uh, Colorado River headwaters in the Rocky Mountains, uh, down through Utah, into Northern Arizona, and down to the Sea of Cortez. Uh, Grand Canyon has a, a land area of about 2,000 square miles, more than just the National Park, but also the other landscapes around it that contribute to the park. The river length in Grand Canyon is about 280 miles. The volume of Grand Canyon, about 750 cubic kilometers. That's an almost unimaginable volume, but it's the world's best known large deep canyon. Right after the Colorado River, just as the Colorado River leaves Grand Canyon, it, uh, it traverses a geologic province boundary. The Colorado Plateau is the geologic province of the upper reaches of the river. It is nicely stacked rock dating in, uh, in age over almost 2 billion years. But the river emerges from the Grand Wash Cliffs and flows south to the Sea of Cortez. Uh, they're entering the Basin and Range Geologic Province. And so the Grand Canyon actually uh, is a part of a mega ecotone of the Colorado Plateau and the Basin and Range Geologic Province boundary landscape. As a, an ecotonal uh, landscape, uh, this region and the Grand Canyon ecoregion uh, is, is a crossroads of ecosystems. And it has been th this way through evolutionary space and time. Four biomes exist here. Uh, those are the, uh, the Mojave Sonoran Desert, the Madrian Mexican uh, uh, wooded, wooded and shrubland deserts, the Intermountain Biome, and the Rocky Mountain Cordilleran bi Biome. These two geologic provinces that I talked about, Colorado Plateau and Basin and Range, there's within the uh, drainage of, of the Grand Canyon area, three and a half kilometer elevation range, so a tremendous elevation range in the landscape. And it's uh, consequently as an ecotone, it mixes all these species from these different biomes and geologic provinces and uh, creates great biodiversity here. 
more than 2,800 plant species, more than 600 vertebrate species. However, that, that biodiversity pales in comparison to the, to the number of macroinvertebrates in the landscape. Uh, an order of magnitude more invertebrates than any of those others. In Grand Canyon ecoregion, we have about 140 species of butterflies and skippers. And within the overall Colorado River Basin, uh, the upper basin, we have about 600 species, I think, overall, within the overall river basin. So what makes this landscape interesting is that during uh, glacial advances, there was a southward and downslope movement of, of life. And then as the glaciers retreated, life moved northward and upslope. So uh, again, back and forth over, over the last couple million years, this has created a tremendous uh, uh, array of, of uh, ha habitats. It's, it's allowed some species to persist in, uh, in refugia through time and really contributes to the biodiversity in the landscape. And of course, everything in the Southwest uh, is dependent on elevation. This uh, C. Art Merriam's work here in Flagstaff back in the uh, late 1800s allowed him to identify the, the life zones that he, uh, that he described for the San Francisco peaks uh, and heading down all the way into the, the bottom of Grand Canyon. So uh, these life zones are very much elevationally dependent. They depend on the amount of uh, precipitation, the temperature range, and the evapotranspiration that goes on across elevation here. Butterflies and skippers are in an order of insects, one of 32 or 33 orders of insects called the scale-winged insects. Lepis scale, patera means wing, so scale-winged insects. This is a photograph of, a, of a, I think, a morpho wing showing the scales attached to the wing there. But when you see color patterns on a, on a butterfly, it's really the, a function of the scales of the wings that you're seeing. And I said, butterflies are a rich, legacy of inspiration for many Colorado Plateau cultures. We're not gonna talk about that as much today as I'd like to, but uh, uh, perhaps we can get Kelly Hayes Gilpin or somebody who knows more about uh, the cultural aspects of, of butterflies in here with us. Butterflies come to us from a lengthy uh, geologic record, of course. Uh, the, the Lepidoptera diverged from a, a common ancestors with the caddisflies. If you know insects at all, caddisflies, or if you, if you fish at all, caddisflies are aquatic insects, but they're also, uh, they have two, two characteristics that, that uh, make them look and resemble butterflies and in, in, in moths in some ways. They have scaled, scaled wings and they spin silk. So those characteristics are something that the, the moths and, and the butterflies also share. There, this divergence happened in or before the Triassic time. So in or before about 250 million years ago. And then uh, for this large lineage of Lepidoptera, most of which are moths, there are uh, a few families of butterflies. We'll talk about uh, six of those families here today. But you can see in this uh, evolutionary tree uh, that the butterflies are, are intermingled with the moths. What distinguishes butterflies from moths is the fact that butterflies have capitate antennae and they're day flying. Most of the moths have just a kind of thin filiform antennae with no, no club on the end of the antenna. And most moths are nocturnal or, um, or at least crepuscular flying in the dusk and dawn. Butterflies are active during the day and they have capitate antennae. All right, as you can see in this illustration of, of a uh, pipeline swallowtail here. The venation of the wings is often obscure, is, is obscured by the scales in almost all cases. Butterflies have two pairs of wings, head, thorax, and abdomen. Uh, all the kind of, kind of wing and leg activity takes, uh, comes out of the thorax of the, of the butterfly. And uh, so it's a, it's a pretty standardized insect structure. Butterflies breathe quasi-passively using uh, spir spiracles. These are invaginations along the uh, segments of the abdomen that allow them to pull air in. Uh, and also on the thorax. But if you look on the right side there, you can see that a, a butterfly wing is actually a, a complex of venation. And uh, the venation is diagnostic for each of the families. Wings are a, a characteristic of insects that has only evolved once and it's been modified ever since the mayflies emerged about 350, 380 million years ago. Um, and so the modifications for the venation of a, drag, of a dragonfly wings can be traced uh, distantly, at least to the butterflies. It's a long, long period of uh, evolution of the wings, much evolutionary testing of the wings, but 
uh, but the venation patterns are similar all across uh, the, the flying insect world. Uh, on the Colorado Plateau, uh, let's see, six families. This is so the northern half of the Colorado uh, of the Colorado River Basin. We've got six families of butterflies, 96 genera, about 240 species. And uh, of course, uh, uh, only about half that number in Grand Canyon itself, but quite an array of, of species. The six families we'll talk about here kind of in sequence. The first of those families, uh, traditionally in the, in the way that butterfly taxonomy is described, are the swallowtails, Papillionidae. And we've got uh, five common species down here in the Grand Canyon region, another couple that are up in the, in the uh, northern reaches of the Colorado River Basin. Papillio multiclaudatus there in the center is our Arizona state butterfly, just in case you're wondering what our state butterfly was. Of these five, the one in the lower right corner there, Papillio indra kaibabensis is, uh, is endemic to the north rim of Grand Canyon, lives in a kind of a thin strip of habitat. One individual blew over to uh, Cameron, so there's one specimen from Cameron, Arizona, but, uh, but this is a species that uh, really occupies that, that uh, north rim habitat in Grand Canyon at upper elevations. Some species here are what we call, call bivoltine, the uh, black swallowtail in the upper left corner is beginning to fly now and will uh, fly again in the in uh, late summer. Uh, whereas Papilio multicaudatus and, and uh, the western tiger swallowtail, Papilio retulus, are uh, summertime flyers. Batis philinor is a late summer flyer coming to us or perhaps uh, perhaps migrating to uh, into the region from uh, lower elevations in late summer after the monsoon start. All right, so those are the swallowtails, one of the, one of the six families we'll talk about here. The next family is called the Pieridae. These involve the whites and the sulfurs. And we've probably all seen these. In our, if, you, if you've been outside, you've seen these butterflies. They're, they're very common in, in the region. At least uh, some of them are very common. The uh, sulfurs include a whole array of species. The largest one is that low, lower left one, Phoebus senna, the cloudless sulfur. A fast flying species in the, uh, in the East Coast. It's uh, often species that is only seen flying north. So that's kind of an odd, odd pattern there. Uh, but uh, Colias urethemi, the one above it, is cabbage butterfly. It's very widespread, very common. It's a species that has been kind of moving eastward as, as more land has opened up uh, eastward in North America. And many, many other uh, sulfurs exist. And these are species, uh, some of the species extend into Central America and uh, common members of the genus are quite abundant in South America as well along the Andes, in the Andes. On the right side there are the whites, the three in, uh, vertical ones there, the common white down below, Poncia protodice, one of uh, three members of that genus, it's quite common here. The one on the top, which is beginning to fly now, we just saw them in the Verde Valley just uh, a week ago, is the Sarah orange tip, a really gorgeous little tiny uh, pyrid butterfly. And then uh, Euclobe hyantus is a, a species that is a uh, marble butterfly, is a common name. They're uh, in the deserts and hiking in Grand Canyon in March a few years back, I discovered that we have a population in Grand Canyon previously un unrecognized. In the middle of the picture is Pyrus rapi, which is a non-native arrived in Grand Canyon about 1996 for the first time, and it's now quite common. It's uh, spread upstream as far, almost as far as Lee's Ferry through the river corridor. So that's the family Pieridae. Again, every species here has its own life history, its own host plants that it feeds on, and, uh, and intricacies about how it's been able to survive and evolve here. Next family are the lichenids, which are the blues, the coppers, and the hair streaks. That should be hair streaks, not strills. Um, and three subfamilies. Hair streaks are represented by uh, a number of butterflies that are really gorgeous. You have to look very closely at these things to be able to see them. Oftentimes, it's the underwings that tell you what species you're looking at, rather than the than the uh, the hind wings or the the, uh, for, the front of the wings. Atlides halesus is is our largest hair streak. It's a species that the larvae feed on mistletoe, so uh, it's found as the mistletoe uh, plants are, are available for this larvae to feed on, and it's it's uh, just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, when when you see them in life, they're um, they're deep blue and purple with this black underwing and red spots. Really, just incredible. Next to it, 
in a different subfamily. The, the Graffidium ex, uh, ex, exile is a uh, is our tiniest butterfly. So it's the tiniest one. Our Arizona state butterfly, Papilio multicaudatus, is the largest butterfly in the in the in the region. Uh, this thing is only a centimeter, uh, not even maybe a centimeter of uh, wing wing uh, diameter overall. Very very tiny. They feed on various uh, weedy plants. Um, then uh, the coppers, uh, Lycaena erota down there in the lower left corner is a really gorgeous butterfly, midsummer flyer, single, single uh, univoltine uh, flyer for the most part. And um, uh, really wonderful things to see. Uh, a common at higher elevations, we don't see them at low elevations here in the Grand Canyon region. Many other blues in the uh, Palio Matinee, the Celestrina Echo uh, is a is a beautiful thing, very abundant here, right, right here in Flagstaff uh, in, in midsummer. So this is the family of, of uh, blues, coppers, and hair streaks. And you've probably all seen these, but there is a, a, a large number of them here in the Southwest. Then the largest family is the, are the Nymphality, the brush-footed butterflies. A great many species, many different color forms. Uh, again, every species has its own story. Starting about now, uh, in the middle of, of the left side there, you'll, you'll see um, uh, morning cloak butterflies beginning to fly. These are butterflies that overwinter as adults and then emerge, lay their eggs on willow. And sometimes you'll see big kind of tents, silk tents of the larvae of these uh, in the first several instars of the, of the larval life uh, here on willows right here in Flagstaff. But there's wide ranging all across elevation down to about uh, 2000 feet or so. Many, uh, many species in the brush, brush footed uh, uh, family, quite a few subfamilies within this, including the uh, the satyrs, the lower right corner there, Solapsis uh, protepida dorothea. That uh, subspecies was named by uh, by Nabokov when he visited Grand Canyon in uh, after World War II. I do not have pictures of uh, the family of Ryodinidae. It's a, a, a family of small butterflies with very long antennae. They are quite difficult to see when they're flying. Oftentimes, they're, uh, they, they tend to flip uh, uh, so quickly that they're, they're difficult to see. But uh, that family is often found feeding on some of our common herbaceous plants here in northern Arizona. Now we're going to go to try to describe to you what skippers are. This is the family Hesperiidae. They differ from butterflies. So on the left side, we've got a uh, kind of a butterfly wing shape a, uh, with the venation patterns there are pretty distinctive. Uh, buckeye butterfly is a classic case of a, of a, of a, a butterfly with uh, that kind of wing venation. Below it is a Yuma skipper. Uh, this is one family of, of butterfly-like uh, creatures. They, are, they have quite, a, quite different wing venation from, the, from butterflies. They also have, they, all, they have capped antennae. So uh, they have capitate antennae, but the antennae tend to be slightly hooked. The, the, the caps tend to be slightly hooked. So whereas the, the other families of butterflies have a rather circular cap on, on it, the skippers have a, have a tight hook. You can see in the upper left-hand corner that, uh, that tight hook. Skippers are very fast flying, uh, very robust bodied. Uh, they're often quite small. Uh, and, um, and but there's a great great diversity of them here in in northern Arizona. I have uh, illustrated those here uh, with uh, just a just a uh, a few of the skipper species that we're, we're we're looking at here. The largest one these are these are in approximately relative size. So the size is smaller than this overall, but uh, approximate size uh, in relation to each of these different genera. Um, uh, lower right corner is the, uh, or one of the giant skippers, uh, Agathemus alliae. This one is uh, endemic, this one endemic to Grand Canyon. The, the larvae feed inside of agaves uh, in plant juices that are like hot soap, basically. They pupate fall on the ground and emerge in August. So the only time you really get to see these, if you're dumb enough to hike in Grand Canyon, in August, you have a chance of seeing these, uh, these things flying around there. Uh, other members of this subfamily uh, are, uh, they feed on yuccas. So it's, uh, there's a lot of specialization on, on, uh, on yuccas and agaves within this group. The other skippers are, many of them are grass feeders. Uh, the larvae are very, uh, very difficult to find. They're quite, uh, quite well camouflaged. 
but a, a wide array of them. Here in the upper elevations, if you hike in Oak Creek Canyon, you'll probably see uh, Epergyrius claris, the, the, uh, the uh, silver spotted skipper. And it's the underwing is shown on the right side, uh, forewing on the, on the uh, left side of that, that specimen. Very common in the spring months are the Arinus butterflies. Uh, these skippers are dark. They're fairly large, so you can actually see them pretty easily. Uh, but as summer comes on, we, we have a, a host of, of very tiny skippers that, uh, that show up in the landscape. Uh, these are typically orange or white or black are the, are the three color patterns. All right, so uh, six families of butterflies. We have about five uh, species that are endemic to Grand Canyon. I mentioned the Indra swallowtail, the Kaibab Indra swallowtail uh, on the north side. Also on the north side, Chelbox fritillary, Speria atlantis. Um, those two are, are found only on the north side of Grand Canyon. The Agathemus uh, alliae, a skipper, a giant skipper, found only inside Grand Canyon. The, the Davies do come up to the rim, but I haven't ever seen this species up on the rims. Could, could be there, but I, I just haven't seen it yet, perhaps. Um, maybe in another 50 years, I'll, I'll get a chance to see it. Uh, typically, you see it on the tunnel platform or at, the, uh, or at other middle elevations in Grand Canyon. I mentioned Solapsus pertepida. This subspecies was discovered by Nabokov when he visited Grand Canyon and described by him. He was a great lepidopterist, uh, worked on the lichenids, on the blues uh, quite, quite extensively. And then we have the, uh, the, uh, the Grand Canyon ringlet in the lower left corner there. Canomorpha tulia furcae is found only in a thin strip of habitat right along the south rim from near Desert View all the way out to Bass Point. So this, this is a species that is, uh, it, it's got about a dozen maybe subspecies around the West. Um, there's another subspecies in the White Mountains of Arizona, uh, but uh, this one shows up only in this thin strip of habitat. And it suffers, I guess, from agoraphobia where it gets out to the edge and gets out to the edge and looks into Grand Canyon and just freaks out and, and heads back to the, the grassy meadows that it uh, lives in just along the thin strip of habitat. So very uh, kind of wonderful uh, range story with that one. And, uh, and it's probably one shared by other species that we haven't, uh, haven't paid much attention to yet. But the rim habitat is, is a very unique habitat, one that is remarkably harsh uh, with, with upwelling hot air and downwelling cold air in the, in the winter months. So it's just really a unique environment. And for some reason, this butterfly likes that, likes that habitat. So about five of the 130, 140 species in Grand Canyon are endemic. So a level of endemism here at uh, about 3% or so, 3.5%. Interestingly, these are all, note that these are all endemic subspecies. That tells us that Grand Canyon has probably not been uh, stable long enough to really foster full species level endemism. So there's butterflies are telling us something about, about climate, long-term climate change in Grand Canyon. 12,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, the upper elevations were probably ice fields and uh, the, the life is, has moved up into this habitat since the glaciers um, and, the, and the ice age conditions waned. Therefore, um, but 12,000 years is really not very much time evolutionarily. And therefore, we don't have full species level endemism going on in the landscape here in, in terms of butterflies. Let's look a little bit now, now about individual species, natural history, and how, how butterfly, butterflies have adapted and, and, uh, and coped with the landscape. I talked about the cloudless sulfur, Phoebus senna, and its distribution. It's actually from the map uh, that's published online here. Uh, this, there don't seem to be many. Uh, there don't seem to be any specimens in northern Arizona. The first specimen of this was actually captured by an early superintendent of Grand Canyon National Park, and these are not easy things to catch. I've I've spent quite a few miles running after these things with a net, trying to trying to nail them. They fly very quickly, and in the East Coast, where they're quite common, as I say, they uh, are almost always seen flying north. Not, that pattern doesn't exist uh, necessarily here in, in Arizona, but we don't really understand whether there's migration going on with these or not. One place you could see these are, uh, are uh, nectaring on red flowers like the crimson monkey flower. So coloration, I wanna talk a bit about coloration here. Camouflage, many butterflies are camouflaged and uh, then many are 
uh, characterized by what we call aposematic coloration. And aposematic coloration is warning coloration, whereas camouflage is just blending in. Some butterflies have camouflaged underwings and aposematically col uh, colored uh, forewing, uh, upper wings. So the upper wing surface is quite brilliant, but they can completely disappear if they fold their leaves and, uh, and land on a, on, a, on a shrub. They'll just blend right into the plant. But aposematic coloration is super common throughout the entire light seeing world, from fish to millipedes to hornets to, uh, to dender batted frogs to gila monsters to vermilion flycatchers, tarantula hawks, and for humans as well, school buses, highway markers, our red light system, red and black, orange and black, orange and yellow uh, and black are, are patterns that, uh, that really uh, automatically serve as warnings. So aposematic coloration is something we see a, a great deal of in, uh, in the butterfly world and, and in the insect world. And F uh, Frederick Miller was able to, uh, he spent many years in the, in the Amazon basin studying patterns of coloration and, and uh, natural history there and came up with a concept that, uh, of, of mimicry that's been attributed to him. So Mullerian mimicry, where all the bad guys look alike. And bad by bad, I mean bad tasting or poisonous or dangerous. Um, so there's convergence within the natural world on color patterns to warn predators to not mess with these things. And in the case of, uh, of the monarch butterfly, posematic, posematically colored, it shares these same color patterns with two other species that live on uh, the, the uh, monarch's host plant. And that host plant story, this is how, how, how a monarch becomes bad, how it becomes bad tasting. So milkweeds have a couple of toxins in their leaves. You know, the milky white sap um, is uh, loaded with latex and cardinalides. Cardinalides function like digitalis, speeding up or even uh, 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 killing the heart in the sap. So uh, the plant has these natural defenses and it also grows quite rapidly. So it's able to recover from attack by uh, insects, but it's, it's, it's basically very well protected from insects. Only a couple of species have been able to kind of crack the chemical code and monarch, uh, cat, monarch butterflies are one of those. And what happens here is the monarch caterpillar feeds on the, on the milkweed. It stores the toxins in its integument. Note that the caterpillar is aposematically colored, different than the, than the adult, but similar similarly aposematically colored. And it's, it's, uh, it just feeds away on the plant, storing the toxins in its integument and discarding the rest. It grows up, it, it uh, transfers those toxins to its chrysalis and to its pupa. And when it emerges as an adult, the wings of the monarch butterfly are loaded with these same plant toxins. So it's a way for the insect to have broken the uh, kind of the chemical arms race with the plant by using the, the, the poisonous substance to protect itself. It's been very well studied by Lincoln Brower, a whole books on the subject and, and lots of discussion about this. It was a very well-known story. Um, uh, there's been uh, an entire theory of, in, in ecology that's, that's arisen up called the plant apparency hypothesis. Plant apparency is not an Italian parenting kind of approach. It's, it's that the plants, plants that are, are annual or uh, sometimes uh, biennial can't afford to lose much leaf area. Therefore, they, they have qualitative toxins, very potent toxins in their leaves. Plants that can afford to be eaten, uh, like uh, tree species, say maples and, and elms and whatnot, um, and oaks, have a, uh, have a quantitative toxin uh, strategy in which they allow tannins, they, they store tannins in their leaves, and those tannins kind of gum up the work to just slow down the feeding success of things that feed on them. But annual plants can't afford that, that luxury of, of uh, putting forth a lot of uh, toxins that will work gradually over time. They need to knock their, their predators right out. So plant apparency has been proposed. It's been disputed now quite a bit, but, um, but it's, a, well, it's, it's an apparent uh, pattern here for the uh, uh, milkweed and monarch butterfly story. So we, we were just talking about malarian mimicry where all the things that are feeding on these toxic plants are poisonous, uh, look alike. Batesian mimicry is a different story. Here's where the cheaters look bad, but they're actually not. And this is the classic case, the monarch and the viceroy. Now, um, the monarchs are bad tasting, poisonous. They're the, kind of the model. And then the viceroy is the lookalike, 
and you can see how closely uh, they resemble the, uh, their model on the east coast of the U.S., uh, but they're faking it. They actually don't feed on milkweeds at all. They feed on willows and cottonwoods um, and, uh, and uh, uh, don't store any of those same toxins. Nonetheless, they can, can get away with, a, with it because uh, Henry Bates looked at that uh, model of mimicry and, uh, and identified it. So it's called Batesian mimicry. We have Viceroy butterflies in Grand Canyon. First one was collected by David Rockefeller in 1934, uh, first and near the last one until I finally uh, uh, went back there. The, he collected it at Phantom Ranch. There's, there are no um, Viceroy's left at Phantom Ranch because the coyote willow host plant is gone there, uh, are largely gone. <clears throat> Down uh, downstream in, Tepe in uh, uh, Deer Creek and in Tapeats Creek, uh, where there where the coyote willows grow along the, those streams, there's a the viceroy uh, butterfly still persists in Grand Canyon. But for many years we thought it was extinct there. Now, our the eastern the eastern uh, viceroy looks a great deal like the monarch, so that's the classic story. Here in the west, though, uh, the the uh, butterfly on the lower left, the queen butterfly, much more common than uh, monarch butterflies. And um, uh, the viceroy butterfly mimics it. The queen butterflies feed on milkweeds, just as the uh, monarchs and, and soldier butterflies do, the three members of that subfamily in the, in the US and North, North America. But the viceroy butterflies resemble, more resemble the more common uh, the name, the, the, the queen, which is uh, the, the common one here. So they tend to look less like the monarch and more like queen butterflies here in the Southwest. A case of shifting mimicry here. Now, not to, not to overemphasize uh, monarchs as an example of butterflies living uh, and, and lepidoptera living on uh, challenging plants. Um, uh, we also looked at sacred detura, a very toxic plant here in the Southwest. Very few insects have been able to crack its chemical code, but one of those is the line sphinx. Uh, Hylis lineata and uh, caterpillars feed on it. Uh, also a couple of leaf beetles and uh, one can only guess what life must be like if you're feeding 100% of your uh, time on, um, on a wildly hallucinogenic plant. Hard to know what those, the lives of these insects is like, but it's gotta be pretty exciting. Um, other plant associations that are quite distinctive uh, in Grand Canyon are the hackberry and the butterflies. Hackberry emperor is a butterfly that lives only on hackberry. The only place you find it are on hackberry plants. Uh, the adults are flying uh, spring and fall. They, they like to be by holding uh, caterpillars feed on hackberry plants. But um, uh, we have many, many cases of butterflies having evolved on single lineages of plants with uh, monarchs uh, here in the in North America, their affiliation is with, with uh, the milkweeds. And uh, that's not the case everywhere in the world. Other, other members of the subfamily in, in Japan and, and South America are not necessarily milkweed feeders. But uh, much local adaptation to the chemistry and much evolution parallelism between butterflies and their host plants. Monarchs are not the only species that migrate by any means. More than 600 butterfly species around the world are migratory, some of them traveling much longer distances than, uh, than monarchs. Uh, the puzzling thing about these butterfly uh, migrations is that it's multi-generational. It takes four, four generations for the monarchs to, to make it all the way up to Canada on their north, northward migration uh, before they turn back and, and head to Mexico or uh, coming down into the Grand Canyon area, they can diverge and head off to California. So the two kind of centers where the butterflies uh, overwinter. Another really prominent migrator in our landscape here is the painted lady butterfly, Vanessa Cardoi. And that one is a species that uh, in, in a, on a big year, year 2000, uh, they, they just swept the landscape here. It was one of the biggest migrations I think we've ever had in North America. Um, in recent years, it, uh, you know, millions and millions of individuals sweeping the northward across the border. This species in, is found around the world. Uh, in, in Europe, it flies from Europe to Africa on its southward migration in one flight, maybe as many as 10 generations to get all the way north, but then one flight to come back. So it's a very widespread species. It's doing remarkable migrations. Uh, they don't get as much attention as monarchs because there is, hasn't been a 
a single location found where it overwinters in mass like, like monarchs do. Nonetheless, uh, migration is a very common feature among the butterflies. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about climate change and butterflies. Uh, uh, we all understand that climate change is going on. The Southwest is particularly hard hit by, by uh, uh, increasing air temperatures. And what this means, of course, is um, the pattern of retreat of plant species upslope as much as they can or uh, can do. There has to be a fairly slow process though. Plants don't have the dispersal mechanisms that, uh, that things like butterflies do. And therefore it's a um, uh, potentially quite a large influence on, on our butterfly diversity over time here as host plant species uh, are dwindle and, and uh, become restricted or disappear. Well, Interestingly, some butterflies have adaptations that allow them to cope with pretty big changes in climate. One of those is the very common Acastus patch butterfly here in Grand Canyon area in Northern Arizona. Closcinia Acastus is a species that if it's been a dry winter, you won't see these things at all. They will stay uh, in their, uh, in their uh, pupil form in leaf litter <clears throat> and you'll, you, you won't see them. If it's a dry summer, no monsoon, you won't see them after the end of the summer. It, the species does fly uh, in a uh, bivoltine fashion two, twice a year, but if it's been a dry winter or a dry summer, you won't see them. If you have a wet winter, the, there'll be a big flush of these, but if it's a dry summer, you won't see them and vice versa. If you have a dry winter, but a wet summer, you'll see them in, in late summer, but not uh, in the springtime. They, they tend to be flying right about now, uh, beginning now, about, about now, um, but it's a classic case of del delayed eclosure, meaning delayed emergence from the pupil state. So uh, this is a species that has, uh, it uh, uh, potentially can be quite well adapted to erratic, uh, more erratic climates and perhaps uh, increased drying, uh, uh, increased drought. We don't understand, at least I don't understand how long a pupa can live. We have cases of, of Lepidoptera, that uh, survived in the pupil state for up to 18 years. So we don't really understand what the, uh, what the range of, op uh, of options are for many of the species we've got, but some species are particularly well suited to, uh, adapt this was well adapted to a, a changing climate. Climate change will affect different habitats in different ways. These are the six rare habitats we have in our, in our region here. Four of them will be affected by climate change in a pretty dramatic fashion. Don't really know about rim habitats. Again, the high levels of, of environmental harshness in, in rim and uh, in, in the rim, rim environments um, make these particularly difficult uh, to, to predict how climate change will affect them. And also, uh, uh, none of our butterflies live in caves, although we have uh, several endemic moths that live in, in caves in Great Canyon. Nonetheless, old growth butterflies, pine forest, alpine meadows. Uh, riparian stream systems and springs are especially uh, um, susceptible to, to climate change. And in the context of overall Grand Canyon biogeography, uh, those kind of habitats show up as refugia in the landscape. Um, we have many examples of, of different biogeographic patterns among the butter, uh, butterflies. We talked about the um, these uh, endemic butterflies that live either on the north or south rim where the canyon is a barrier to their movement across. Uh, quite a few species uh, come up from the bottom or down from the top of the of the uh, of the canyon, uh, but can't pass through the whole river corridor. And then uh, some species are restricted to the eastern or western basins of the canyon. But refugia in Grand Canyon, like springs, for example, are really important, uh, really important microhabitats. In a study that we did back in 2002. I documented that there were three to five times more butterfly species and up to 500 times more individual butterflies at springs than in the surrounding landscapes. So uh, springs are particularly supportive. My colleague, James Brock, uh, has been studying survivorship of, of the pupae of butterflies, finding that they need moist soil. And so springs provide you know, moist soil year round. And that may be the reason we see such high concentrations uh, around the springs. Also, butterflies are commonly coming to springs to feed on salt and to water and to, to acquire salt. So uh, many of our springs are, are salt, uh, salt depositing and may attract them that way too. So in terms of understanding climate change uh, and its influence on uh, Grand Canyon regional butterflies, 
one thing that's quite apparent, we've got about nine species that have been reported uh, in the last 50 years here is kind of new in the region. And these are all coming from the south. So climate change is advancing from south to north, tropical um, uh, buckeye butterflies, the increasing frequency of baddest felinor, the, the uh, pipeline swallowtail on the floor of Grand Canyon, examples of this northward movement. There are species, as I said, with the uh, Castus patch that, uh, that can uh, control their emergence. And so some of those species are becoming more prominent. Closinia castus is, is, is now one of the dominant species in Grand Canyon. There's evidence of increasing uh, behavioral plasticity. The Kaiba bender swallowtail was supposed to be a univoltine summertime flying species. I hiked up the Nankwe Trail in April a few years back and saw inter swallowtails. Um, and that's a, a novel uh, timing there. Their ability to shift their, their life history to accommodate when, when their host plants are out that may allow them more uh, persistence in the landscape. But there's so much we don't know. Exploration of these patterns and trends uh, is an ongoing effort. There are quite a few people studying butterflies around the, uh, around the Western US and particularly in relation to uh, changing climate conditions. So there's, there's just lots more to learn in this, in this whole arena and lots of uncertainty. So in conclusion, it's been a pleasure talking with you about butterflies in Grand Canyon, a huge fascinating subject. We could go on for weeks about this topic. It's worth a, uh, you know, a, a whole book in itself. But Grand Canyon has a high diversity of butterflies. And it's, uh, uh, it, it's part of the reason for that is that it has been and continues to be a mixing zone over, over time uh, of this mega, across this mega ecotone. And uh, partly related to the interprovincial uh, ecotonal nature, nature of where Grand Canyon falls in the landscape. All the newly detected species in, the lands, in this landscape are derived from the south, telling us that climate change is, is, uh, it, is advancing. Uh, but all the species have their own, uh, own individual stories and they have vastly dis, uh, different dispersal capacities. Some like the highly migratory uh, painted lady butterflies are found across the entire world. Others like the Grand Canyon ringlet found just in a thin strip of habitat just along the South Rim and nowhere else. But nonetheless, most species are affected by Grand Canyon as a landscape. This is a landscape in which the more uh, mobile species, dragonflies, butterflies, tend to be more diverse relative to the overall um, uh, diversity of their, of their group. Um, so, uh, so our high diversity of butterflies is, is maybe not so surprising because of their great fragility, their great mobility. Endemism here is relatively low at the species level, but subspecies, subspecies endemism is relatively high. Uh, again, there has not been enough time for, uh, in its present state for Grand Canyon to support full-blown species level endemism, but there's been a gradual evolution of subspecies in the landscape. And that's a, a pattern that will undoubtedly uh, continue for us. Um, even though I'm saying that um, we, we have uh, just five distinctive subspecies that have been recognized, just about every butterfly that is uh, that lives inside Grand Canyon you know, is uh, is found, say, on the floor of Grand Canyon, tends to show some slight differences from other uh, butterflies outside that outside the canyon that are that are attributed to the same species. So there's a, a Grand Canyon signature on butterflies like our uh, hackberry emperor, for example. They look quite different than those that are, that are outside Grand Canyon, but they haven't been described as separate subspecies yet. Some species are behaviorally protected from climate change. I talked about the delayed closure, but uh, uh, case of uh, Acastus patch, um, but some species and some rare habitats are not well protected and, uh, and are at risk to uh, climate change. One way to, to help uh, butterflies in the landscape, of course, is to plant pollinator friendly plants in your yard. And there is quite an array, you can go to any garden store and they'll tell you um, uh, what species might be, might be good. Species like, uh, it's best to plant natives uh, where you can, or if you're planting non-natives, make sure there's species that don't, don't uh, go wild and spread. Purple Russian sage seems to be particularly good for, for pollinators in our, in our area here, but uh, um, other species like uh, some of the, uh, the ribes, the current uh, bushes are really good for, for early, early flying pollinators. So if you wanna find out more about that, 
uh, get a hold of us here at the museum uh, or go to your your uh, local plant store and they, there's uh, much literature available on that. Uh, the first question is, is are any of these species endangered? Again, so um, uh, the ha their habitats might be endangered, but um, none of our species are listed. There have, we have um, several species that are, uh, that are quite, quite restricted, like the Grand Canyon ringlet, for example, but its habitat is well protected. So um, even though it could qualify for federal attention if it was living in, uh, not living in a, in a national park landscape, um, uh, it, it's not on the, on the endangered species list. So uh, right now, none of these species are, are endangered. There's been some move to try to list uh, monarch butterflies. And that may come about with a widespread species that's in such uh, uh, kind of dramatic decline. 90% of the monarch butterfly population has, has, has disappeared. But that's a, quite a serious concern. And uh, that might be, a, might be a species that we'd expect to see on the, list, on the federal list before too long. For the butterfly species living within the canyon, uh, do you know where their nesting sites are? So uh, butterflies don't nest per se. They, uh, they're... Uh, attention to habitat is based on their host plants. So uh, say the hackberry emperor butterfly, the only place you find it are on hackberry, uh, in hackberry stands. So, and if you wanna see that butterfly, you have to go there. Otherwise you will not see it in the landscape. And so it's not that butterflies are nesting uh, so much. They are, they are attracted to their host plants. Uh, they find their host plants through chemical detection, typically as they're flying around. And then they, they can be quite tightly associated with those, with those host plants. Do you know, see, what the biggest butterfly is or what species of butterfly is the largest? Well, the, the, some of the uh, bird wings in, in South, uh, Southeast Asia uh, are huge. They're dinner plate size. Our largest butterfly here in the Southwest, uh, probably the largest butterfly in the, in the country is, the, is our many-tailed swallowtail which is um, saucer-sized. Great. Thank you so much, Larry.